Hello and welcome back to Living Let Die. Today we're going to learn how to make an updated version of my Colorado green chili. We're going to make this with fresh hatched green chilies. A lot of people had written in and wanted to see a recipe that had fresh chilies with uh, homemade chicken stock. So we did a video on homemade chicken stock and now we're going to do the video on uh, fresh made uh, green chili with hatched chilies. And here's a list of ingredients you're going to need for today. Now you're going to need somewhere around 6 to 12 hatched chilies depending on the size of your chilies. You want 2 to 3 cups of uh, fresh roasted hatched chilies when you're done. You'll see I'm using homemade uh, chicken broth, 2 quarts of that. I'll uh, put up a link to uh, how I make my chicken broth. It's a basic chicken broth but it's way better than the store-bought stuff and store-bought stuff really lacks in flavor especially for this dish. Okay we're going to start off by roasting our green chilies so we're going to preheat our oven to 450 degrees. And it's going to take anywhere about 15 to 20 minutes to do these. Really, you're just going to be looking at them the whole time. And, uh, you know, when they get nice blistered and, and the skin is, you know, really dark and, and charred, that's when you're, you'll know you're done. But we're going to put them into a bowl right now. Now, you'll notice I selected really flat chilies. I'll talk about that in a second. I'm just going to lightly coat them with a little bit of vegetable oil or olive oil or canola oil. You can use the spray oil or whatever you have on hand. And we're going to go ahead and mix them up. Again, like I said, you're going to need two and a half cups of uh, diced chilies, anywhere from two and a half to three cups of diced green chilies when you're done. Um, so it may vary depending on, I'll, I'll do about two batches of these and then I'll just kind of reserve whatever I have left over. Like I said, you're going to try and select chilies that lay flat. If they're curved up, they won't really char evenly. So you want to look for chilies that lay flat and they're nice and fresh and not bruised up or anything. And one of the things I do, I like to poke the green chilies, just one little hole in each of them. If you don't poke them, a lot of them uh, will puff up and some of them will explode and that can kind of make a mess in your oven. So just give them a little poke, it won't hurt them. And we move the rack to the top position and we're going to set our chilies right on the, that rack, right up near the, the uh, element there. And again, it's going to take 15 to 20 minutes. You're going to rotate them every now and then just to make sure you char them evenly. Now, a lot of times you can get those chilies fresh roasted from like, we used to go to the flea market in Colorado and there would be a guy roasting chilies there and that's where we get them, but we don't have that here in Nashville, so um, we're going to do this in the oven to, you know, do the best we can with what we have here. So you'll see they're getting kind of dark and they're starting to blister, but you, you really want them nice and charred, so they, they won't all cook evenly at the same time depending on your oven. So I have the convection turned on in my oven just to kind of make it heat more evenly, but even then you'll see some will cook faster than others. You know, starting to blister and char, they look really good. And it's very important that you know you get that blistering on there. It's uh, important later on when you're trying to remove, remove the skins. Okay, you see I have a bowl up there and it's a tin foil set to the side. I'll take them out and I'll take a look at them. Like I said, they won't all cook evenly, so this smaller one here will come out first. And then the rest of them need a little bit longer to go. I don't want to overcook them or brown them too much, so as they get done, I'll take them out and I'll put them in that bowl. And you want to go ahead and kind of fold that foil nice and tight around the edges there. And what this does is this helps the steam kind of collect them there and steams the, uh, the chilies to make the skin easier to remove, kind of like what you would do with uh, other vegetables like charred peppers and stuff, charred green peppers or, or tomatoes. You'll see we're just about all done here. They're nice and brown and really blistered. You see I'm, I'm just going to remove them, put them in a bowl. Or drop them a few times, but you know, I'll remove them, put them in a bowl, and um, cover them for 25 to 30 minutes. I usually prepare my other vegetables while I'm doing that. While, while, the, while the chilies are steaming, I'll work on the rest of my vegetables. This one's not exactly done yet, so it'll go in. Just for a couple more minutes there. And I'm going to lid that nice and tight and let those peppers kind of steam in Okay, to prep the, the uh, hatch green chilies, you're going to want to go ahead and peel them and de-seed them. 
And you'll see after steaming, the, the skins will just pretty much just pull right off really easy. And I'll pick them up and I'll visually, you know, take a closer look just to make sure I get all the skins off. And that's kind of, I'll be off camera just for a second, just while I kind of pick them up and look at them. See, I'm just going to kind of pick them up and visually take a look there. And sorry, I'm off camera here. I didn't realize what my camera was, but then I'm going to go ahead and run my finger down there just to open the seam, kind of lay them flat. Then I'll remove the stem and most of the seeds, just kind of pull it out and then shake your fingers over the garbage can. You want to get all the seeds off your fingers. We're getting rid of the seeds because the seeds kind of make everything bitter. So you want to, you know, get rid of as many of the seeds, all the seeds if you can, but get, get rid of, you know, the seeds and uh, do a couple more visual inspections later just to make sure we get the seeds off. And you see, I'm just using the back of my knife to kind of scrape and move into a pile. You know, don't press too hard because you don't want to remove the flesh. You are. That's a green chili, and I'll just put that in a bowl, and I'll do that for the rest of my chilies. Now to prep an onion, you know, it's a pretty common thing to prep an onion, but one thing I like to kind of stress to people that are home cooks is there's plenty of people that will tell you to, uh, when you're dicing an onion, you use a horizontal cut. A horizontal cut is probably the most common way for people that aren't professional cooks to cut themselves, and it's not really necessary. I've been cooking for years, and uh, I've never been told by any of the chefs I've worked for that my onion dice was not acceptable, and I've never used a horizontal cut. You see, I just cut some lines, vertical lines, and then just dice it up. It's pretty even dice, no horizontal cut needed. If, I, if you want it minced, just make your lines closer together and cut thinner slices. When I get to the end, I'll turn the end on its side and just chop it up, and it's pretty standard dice. I'm going to place half the onions into the bowl of a food processor that I have set off to the side there. We're going to be processing up some of the vegetables, but half of them go into that food processor, and then again, the other half the onion here. Again, just making slots and vertical lines. Notice I got my fingers curled back and out of the way, using them as a guide so I can't cut myself. Flip it on its side and then just finishing up the dice. Now the other half of this onion I'm going to go ahead and put in that stainless bowl you see there. And that'll go into the soup directly. Just go ahead and set that off to the side. And, uh, we're going to do that for a few of our vegetables. Here we have the tomatillo. Same thing. We're going to slice up the tomatillos. I'll remove the core. Just give it a little snip on each side to get that core out of there. Throw that core away. And then I'll cut this into slices. Again, it doesn't have to be exact, but you see like little thin slices. And again, half of these will go into that bowl with the food processor. And then the other half will go back into that stainless bowl that, that's right in front of us where we put the onion. And we're going to do that for all three of our tomatillos. And once you've got your tomatillos done, you're going to do the garlic. I like to use 8 to 10 regular cloves. These are colossal garlic cloves, so I won't use as many, maybe, you know, 4 or 5 of these. Um, but 8 to 10, or almost even sometimes, depending on how big the bulb is, a whole bulb of garlic. It sounds like a lot of garlic, but it really does not uh, affect the favor negatively. And we're going to give it a crush and a mince. I think you want to mince this pretty good. You don't want huge chunks of garlic floating around in your chili, so... And you'll hear the, uh, the oven's preheated back then. I was actually doing this while I was waiting for the oven to preheat. When I roasted my chilies back there. You know, and sometimes with your garlic here, like I said, these big garlic cloves, they don't smash as good. We'll give them a couple whacks here. And if they don't smash as good and you can't get them to break down, just kind of cut vertical lines in them. This way you know you're getting a good mince. Turn it over to the side, and you'll see it just comes up with a nice, solid mince. Fingers curl back, thumb using it as a guide. Make sure your thumb's behind your fingers there. Kind of guide whatever you're cutting there. And we're going to do that for all ten cloves of garlic, or in this case, you know, four or five. Again, it really just depends on the size of the garlic. 
And we're gonna remove that to a plate. We're not putting that in either one of the bowls. We're just gonna remove that to a plate. And next we need about a you know quarter to a third cup of cilantro. I'm never really exact. I just kind of take about half of the bunch and take the leaves off. I remove as many stems as I can. I don't like a whole lot of stems in it. You can use the stems. It doesn't hurt the flavor or anything. But And you'll see I'm kind of chopping it really fine here. You know, you'll see I, I put my hand on top of the, uh, the blade and I use it as a pivot point to chop. And that's probably the best way to, uh, to chop herbs. My knife is real sharp so it doesn't bruise up the herbs too much. And one of the reasons I'm really getting a fine chop on this is because uh, all, of, all of the cilantro goes into the food processor. And if you have big leaves, they tend to stick to the side of the bowl and you don't want that. So I'll give them a good chop here and kind of they seem to blend better when they're chopped up well. So take an extra time to get my cilantro good and minced. You see it broke down pretty good here. And then again, using my bench scraper, I'm just going to take all of that and see a couple parts where I need to get it a little bit better. Again, I'm just trying to make sure that I don't have big leaves that'll stick to the side of the food processor bowl. And all the cilantro goes into the food processor. We're making kind of a salsa verde out of all that stuff. Next thing we're going to work on is our pickled jalapenos. You can use fresh jalapenos. I really think pickled jalapenos add a certain flavor. Um, the heat isn't as intense, and I, I started using these when I first made up this recipe, and it's, it just works great. So I use the, the regular canned pickled jalapenos for consistency's sake. You could pickle them yourself, but I find that if you use the same can of pickled jalapenos, you get a good consistency of flavor, and really you want to know at the end of the dish what your, what your dish is going to taste like. You know, and you're going to want to wash your hands after this and not touch your eyes because, you know, of course, when you're messing with jalapenos, that can burn. Now we're just going to give this a fine mince. And what we're looking for is somewhere about it, yeah, anywhere eight, between an eighth and a quarter, somewhere between an eighth and a quarter cup of pickled jalapenos. kind of mincing them up here, just a regular mince. And you're gonna do, want to do that with all your pickled jalapenos. You know, and depending on size, you know, you'll, you'll get a different amount, you know, depending on the size of your pickled jalapenos. And just kind of turn it to the side and give it a regular mince. Now for consistency's sake, I'm gonna measure out just over an eighth a cup of pickled jalapenos. This way I know pretty much all the time what that contents of my food process is gonna taste like. And if I wanna add a little bit more later, I'll just kinda of scoop them up and leave them in this measuring cup and set them off to the side and then I can put them in later if I want to. Okay, onto our green chilies. We've got them all seeded and, uh, and stemmed and got the peels off, so we're just gonna to wanna to, to dice these. So we're just going to want to basically simmer them down and Again, just a regular dice here. What I'm doing is I'll just pick them up, inspect them, make sure I have all the seeds off. If I find a seed, I'll take it off and just cut some lines down there. It doesn't have to be perfect, it's just a regular dice. You don't want to do that with all your chilies. You know, and again, for consistency's sake, I like to take and measure out the, the green chilies. You're going to want two and a half to three cups of diced chilies. You'll see I have a little bit more chilies over there off to the side. If I need more, I can I can prepare a few more. But anywhere between two and a, two to two to three cups, two and a half to three cups of chilies is what you're looking for. So I'll just kind of use a measuring cup and pack them in a little bit. Not too hard, not 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 like firm packed or anything. 
You'll see I got about two and a half cups. And so now that I know I have two and a half cups, I'll just kind of throw them back together in a pile. Then we're going to just kind of eyeball half of them. We don't, don't, it doesn't have to be exact. We're just kind of kind of put them in a pile and then cut half of them out with the, with the bench scraper. And half the, of the green chilies are going to go into our food processor bowl. And half of them will go into the bowl with the rest of the vegetables that we have. And now we're going to work on our pork. You know, I, I said about a half pound of pork. It really depends on how much pork you want. Um, I don't like a whole lot of pork in this, but then some people like a lot of pork. So you can put a pound of pork. You can put a pound and a half of pork. This is somewhere around a half a pound. I'm using like three country ribs here. I'm just going to cut them into small dice. I'll show you again what size we're looking for. They're just small cubes. And of course, anytime you're handling meat, you're going to want to go ahead and wash your hands afterwards. Uh, I wash my hands after this step and after the next step, just because when you're dealing with raw pork, anytime you're going to incorporate other ingredients, you want to make sure your hands are clean. So I've washed my hands just so I can get into my flour jar here. And then I'm going to add three tablespoons, pretty heaping tablespoons, of flour. Now what this flour does, it's, it's going to coat the... Uh, pork here. You see I use my hands to kind of mix it up again. I'm going to wash my hands after this step. I'm going to kind of mix it up here. What that's going to do is when I brown that pork off, it's going to kind of turn that flour into a fond in the bottom. Almost like a roux. Not really. It's going to be some, somewhat thickening for the stew, but it's also going to uh, create a fond in the bottom of our Dutch oven. But we'll get to that here in a second. So we got our food processor ingredients. We're just going to go ahead and give that a process. We're going to process that on medium until it gets about the the consistency of a salsa verde. You know, see, because I diced up the cilantro really well, you we don't have a lot of cilantro leaves sticking to the side. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get into our Dutch oven now. Now here we have three to four bacon rashers, depending on how thick your bacon is. We're going to Go ahead and add that into the pan with a, just a little bit of oil. What we're trying to do is we're trying to render it down a little bit. And we'll get some of the bacon fat out so we can incorporate that into the fawn and kind of use that to help flavor the rest of the dish. So we'll use our spoon here to kind of flatten it out, make sure we get good surface contact. And my heat's not too high. I'm trying to extract the fat. I'm not trying to crisp the bacon. I'm trying to cook it, but I'm not trying to crisp it. I'm trying to just kind of render the fat out of it. So I'm going to move it around a bit after it, you know, kind of renders on one side. I'm trying to get as much of the fat out of that bacon as I can. You see, it's not cooked fully. It's uh, just cooked enough to where I can extract most of the fat from it. And you really don't want to use too high of a heat in a Dutch oven anyway, so, you know, a medium heat, maybe a little bit above medium is fine. Again, you'll see we've got a lot of the fat out. There's still a lot of meat left on the bacon. Um, we could, of course, cook this further. You see, kind of the bacon's starting a little fond on the bottom of the pan, so I'm going to reduce my heat. I'm going to use a slotted spoon to kind of get as much bacon as I can out without removing too much grease. That bacon fat really helps impart really great flavor to the dish. And we're going to 
gonna want to get as much of the bacon out as we can. We don't want any little spots in there. And this is uh, about a tablespoon and a half, two tablespoons of reserved bacon fat that I had just kind of store it in the fridge for instances like this when I really need it. And we're gonna go ahead and melt that down. And we the, oh, you also want that to heat up. And the way you check that is with the back of your spoon. So like, you know, when the bacon grease is hot enough, you'll see the, the it starts to bubble at the bottom of the spoon there. That means it's getting up to about 350 degrees. And then we're gonna go ahead and add our pork. Depending on how much pork you're using, you, you wanna do this in batches. You don't wanna overcrowd it. And once you get it spread out, don't move it. Because we're not trying to wash the uh, flour off. We're not trying to, you know, disturb it too much. We just want it to brown on one side and flip it over, kind of stir it around until it's cooked on evenly on all sides. And we're trying to build that fond in the bottom of the pan. Really make sure you have a medium to medium low heat here. Um, anything more than that and your fawn's gonna burn. It's a real trick. It's kind of an art form to make a fawn in the bottom of a Dutch, Dutch oven, but when you're doing anything like braising and stew, if you can create a great fawn, it really makes a difference when it comes to cooking a, anything in a Dutch oven, that fawn that you create in the bottom. So again, just kind of pushing everything to make sure we get good surface contact. We're not cooking the meat all the way through. We're just kind of browning the flour. That, that'll remove some of the flour flavor and make it kind of nutty. You'll see here, we've kind of browned every side. We're not looking for a golden color or anything. We're not trying to fry it. We're just building the fawn in the bottom of the pan. You'll see that fawn is in, in the bottom. It's, it's dark, but it's not burned. You know, like I said, you're gonna have to really get to know your oven you get to know your Dutch oven, and uh, it takes you know a, a, a real steady hand and a you know a lot of attention to make a great fond without burning it. Kind of like when you make a roux. So I'm just going to take the slotted spoon and remove the pork to the bowl where I had the bacon. We'll bring that back in later. You'll see that fond is in there. But I don't quite have enough oil. It doesn't look like you know that. Flour has soaked up a lot of the bacon fat, which is fine because all that flour is going to melt off later in the stew and become part of the dish and impart really great flavor to it. You see, we're building a layer. It's kind of a bacony, nutty, nutty layer we just added there. So we don't have enough oil, so I'm going to add just, we're gonna just, just under a tablespoon, just you know, enough to saute some vegetables. And here's our bowl of vegetables that we set aside. So we're going to go ahead and add that in there. You see, I put like a you know, maybe a quarter, maybe less than a quarter of a red bell pepper. That's just for color to add some nice little red, you know, color contrast to the, to the chili. You don't really need it in there, but I've, I've always put that little bit of red bell pepper in there, so I, I definitely suggest it. And I use red because the red bell pepper is a little sweeter. It doesn't really affect the taste of the chili. So here we are. We're just going to saute those vegetables in that oil. And you notice I didn't add the garlic. If you add the garlic too early, the garlic will turn bitter, so we don't want that. We're just kind of softening the vegetables. You'll see the onions have turned translucent here. And that's what you're looking for. And you're kind of scraping the bottom and incorporating some of that fawn in there and getting the flavor of the vegetables down into the fawn in the bottom because we're going to deglaze that later with the chicken broth. And then all that flavor is going to kind of come up from the bottom and become part of the dish. And this is my longest video basically because all these steps are very important to the final product. So. You'll see all the vegetables are starting to break down, the tomatillos are starting to, to render down, the onions are translucent, you've got that fawn in the bottom that's not burned. And some of the juices will start to loosen up that fawn, some of the juices from the vegetables. And you might hit this with a little salt and pepper if you're you know, seasoning in stages like you should. Um, I season very lightly in stages, so a little bit of salt and some fresh cracked black pepper right here is, is a fine taste. It'll help extract some of the juices from the vegetables. Just a pinch of kosher salt and some fresh ground black pepper. And give that a mix.
Now that a vegetable is kind of rendered down and everything's kind of cooked, I'm going to add our meats back to the dish. And then our garlic. You see, that's about how much garlic you want. Fresh garlic is really the only garlic you can use in this, just the, jar the jarred garlic doesn't taste the same. And because of the amount of it, you really want to use fresh garlic. And then we're not going to cook this too much like this. We're just going to kind of mix it around to get everything mixed in, let that garlic get spread around. And 45 seconds to 90 seconds is as much as you want to saute garlic. So here it's about 90 seconds. Scraping the bottom lightly to kind of get up some of the fawn, the fawn from the bottom. All the salt's kind of loosened up some of the juices and that's helping to glaze the pan. Tap, turn my spoon off. And then uh, in comes the chicken stock. Now I have a link in the description and I'll provide a link here to the homemade chicken stock I use. It's a pretty basic recipe for chicken stock, but you really can't use store-bought chicken stock for this. It's too bland, it's too light, it doesn't have enough flavor. So make sure you uh, check out my chicken broth video and you'll see the broth I use in the jambalaya. Pretty much every recipe I use this broth. Uh, I had, my old video had canned broth in it because I, I wanted to show a video for people that didn't want to make their broth and couldn't get fresh green chilies, so all they had access to was canned green chilies. Now here's the contents of that food processor. Go ahead and add that right after our chicken stock. And pretty much we're getting everything into the pan right now. We're getting to the point where we want to simmer it and, and getting into the final stages here. You know, there's still, of course, a good 45 minutes left of simmering and breaking everything down. You know, we got, we got our heat up and it's, it, you know, it's starting to come to up to temperature. You want to bring that up to a boil and while it's kind of heating up, I like to hand crush a can of tomatoes. You can use fresh tomatoes if you want to peel them and seed them, but you got to, you know, that, that takes a lot of time. I think the canned tomatoes works great here. Um, you'll see I'm hand crushing them, but I'm removing any hard parts of core. And I've drained them too because I don't want it to really turn my chili red. Green chili isn't called green chili because of its color. It's called green chili because of the hatch green chilies that you use in it, but a lot of people think it has to be green, and that's why it's called green chili. That's actually um, a, a misinterpretation. It's called green chili because it's hatch green chilies that are the primary ingredient. So let's see, we'll give it a little stir here. And see, it add, the, the red adds a nice contrast to color the tomatoes and the bell peppers. And you'll see any kind of big pieces of anything, I'm kind of breaking down. If I see like a big piece of tomato, I'll use my spoon and kind of press it up against the side of the Dutch oven and kind of break it up a little bit more if I didn't break it up, up enough. I don't want big, huge chunks of tomatoes in this. Okay, you'll see it's starting to come up to temp. We're going to add our spices now. Most important spice in this dish is the green chili powder. A lot of people use red chili powder. Red chili powder does not taste anything like green chili powder. So you want to go and find yourself some green chili powder. Savory Spice has a really great version of green chili powder. And you want to use three heaping tablespoons of that in here. Like I said, if you use the red chili powder, it's going to taste like red chili. It's not supposed to taste like that. This is totally different. And here we have a couple, about a teaspoon and a half of cumin, maybe a little bit more than a teaspoon and a half of cumin. And then I'll start with about a tablespoon and a half of chicken bouillon. This ramps up the chicken flavor, and I'll kind of use this to adjust the flavoring of the dish. The spices are almost exact, and basically I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll use that chicken bouillon after we simmer. I may add a little bit more. I'll just kind of taste it after it simmers for like 30, 45 minutes and use the chicken bouillon to adjust the flavoring. Okay, we're going to bring it up to a boil, and then we're going to reduce it to a simmer, so medium-low or whatever it takes to maintain a simmer on your stove. Give it one last stir. 
scraping the bottom a little bit to try to get any of that fond up. You don't want anything to burn on the bottom. And you're gonna come back and you're gonna stir this every now and then, scraping the bottom to make sure where nothing's on the bottom burning. So we'll give it a good stir. And then lit it up. And we'll let that simmer for anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. Coming back to stir it every now and then. Now, different people prefer different thicknesses of green chili. Some people like it, you know, like a soupy like this, and some people prefer it a little more thick. Um, I've done it both ways. I, I like it both ways. So if you like a thicker chili, then what you want to do is, uh, you know, add some cornstarch diluted in water. We'll do that later. You know your chili's getting close to done when you pick up the pork pieces and they easily break up with a spoon. So I use a strainer spoon and I'll just kind of pick them up and then use a wooden spoon to crush them and that kind of tells me when my chili's done. Your chili's done when those pieces of pork basically are, are fork tender. And then I'll go through and I'll smash up as much of the pork as I can. I mean, I'll try to leave not one single cube of pork, you know, uncrushed. You'll see I just kind of break it up and then I'll scoop them, scoop them off into the chili. I'll, it takes me probably a good 15, 20 minutes to get all of the pork broke down like this. But I think it's a really important step. You see, it's still a little bit hard, so I'll, you know, maybe a few minutes, definitely, a, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes more. Because it should easily crush with that wooden spoon. You see, I'm kind of moving everything out of my way, so any chilies or tomatoes that get in my spoon, I'll just kind of scoop them off. And then, after I've broken it all down, you'll see it's, it's got a decent consistency to it, but if I want it a little thicker, this is two tablespoons of cornstarch dissolved in just enough water to dissolve it. And you'll want someone to keep stirring. you want to keep stirring because if you pour it in all at once, you're going to have clumps of, of cornstarch in there. So be, be stirring it constantly while you add your cornstarch slurry. Now in order for cornstarch to thicken correctly, you're going to want to bring it back up to a boil, then reduce to a simmer so all the cornstarch uh, bursts and kind of makes that that thick looking chili. You'll see it's got a real thick good look right here. You know, cling to the back of that spoon. you see it's clinging to the spoon now. And that's really what you're looking for right there. That's a good looking green chili and the flavor is amazing. You can adjust this with your chicken bouillon spices or add a little bit of spices, more cumin or more green chili powder if you like. That's, that's a great green chili. to combine everything here and that's pretty much it as far as for green chili it's really easy and you see it looks really great it's nice and thick now that we've added that cornstarch in there and yes it is green and it just looks perfect and you know there are plenty of ways you can serve this you see it just it's thick it sticks to the spoon um, I like to have it over burritos one of my favorite ways to serve it is uh, like you see here, oh, potatoes with eggs and cheese. That's a really classic Colorado combination. Um, another way to have it is like on a fried chimichanga, like a traditional, uh, you know, chimichanga plate with smothered green chili and, and all your vegetables on it. But anyway, thank you for visiting. I hope you enjoyed. I know my family does, and uh, more videos coming soon. Thanks for visiting. Have a great day.